Hi, everyone. I'm Barack Zahavi. I'm the Director of Information Systems for the Office of the Vice Provost for Research at the University of Pennsylvania. The title of my talk is Enabling Research Excellence with Electronic Notebooks, which fits in the EDUCAUSE Conference's Enable Research Discovery Track. I've been working on systems at Penn for over six years, and before that, I worked in various roles in IT uh, at Columbia University for uh, 13 years. I like to say that I help my institution implement technology solutions and tools for researchers so that they can focus on their discoveries and not worry about the systems. Just a quick disclaimer, I will be talking about research notebooks, but while I took chemistry lab as an undergrad years ago, I'm not a researcher. Anyway, thank you for your interest and for tuning in. I hope that you'll find value in learning from what I have to share about Penn's experience in implementing an electronic research notebook system and exploring its impacts. The research notebook has evolved a little over the centuries, but um, it's arguably didn't change all that much for a long time. 3,600 years ago, ancient Egyptians recorded on papyrus observations on preventing and curing infection with honey and moldy bread. Uh, fast forward 500 years ago to 500 years ago when da Vinci made his beautiful anatomical drawings uh, uh, in his notebooks. A little later, Galileo mapped celestial objects and in the 19th century, Darwin made sketches of species relationships in his notebooks. So clearly the research notebook has a rich and significant history. And it remains critical to scientific discovery, but, but the notebooks that we'll be discussing today look a bit different. Before we talk about them, uh, let me share my agenda. Uh, I will start out with some background about my institution. Uh, then I will talk about electronic research notebooks and their benefits. I'll get into more of a definition in detail in a bit, but for the sake of this talk, electronic research notebook and electronic lab notebook and uh, our online research notebook are, um, are the same, and I'll abbreviate it as ERM. Uh, and an ERM to us is basically an online manifestation of your traditional physical lab notebook. Again, more details in a bit. I will then discuss our uh, ERN implementation at Penn as a case study. Uh, I will highlight our activities prior to deploying the solution and our keys to success and some of the impacts. And woven into our discussion about Penn's implementation is how we address the following questions. What can we do uh, in IT about general challenges of research reproducibility and limitations of traditional research notebooks? And how do we implement a university-wide solution at a complex decentralized institution? My hope is that today you will uh, gain insights on how to do that and implement uh, an ERN in a complex environment and explore ideas for engaging your community of researchers and consider some of the impacts of research notebook solutions in general. Before I dive in a little about my institution, the University of Pennsylvania was founded in 1740. It's in Philadelphia. Uh, you can see your demographics on the screen. Um, I do want to highlight that research is an esteemed enterprise at Penn with 189 research centers and institutes, nearly 5,000 faculty and 1,300 postdocs, and a research budget of over a billion dollars. The scale and interdisciplinary character of Penn's research activities makes us a nationally ranked university. And given this relatively large size, together with our 12 schools, as well as a large number of academic departments and programs, we are inherently complex. Also, it is relevant to our discussion that Penn as an organization is decentralized. We have a strong central IT organization, but as it relates to IT, we are still pretty distributed. Penn's management and budget model is something called responsibility center management. Maybe a topic for another talk, you can Google it. But for our purposes, it contributes to the decentralized nature of our university. And let's just say that doesn't make central campus-wide solutions a piece of cake. More on how we navigated that later. Now, a couple of years ago, my office at Penn launched a research excellence initiative to support research credibility and integrity on in our campus, as we would like Penn to always be making valuable contributions to society. Now, a key goal of the program was to reinforce Penn's commitment to a culture that embraces the highest quality of reproducible research. 
Now, though issues regarding irreproducibility of research has been of some concern for many years, way beyond Penn, recent reporting of these challenges have emphasized the magnitude of the problem across research disciplines and institutions. The scientific community has been exploring many strategies and ideas to bolster research excellence, which I gained a greater appreciation for uh, when I attended a Philadelphia uh, regional symposium that our office led in 2018. While many factors contribute to these issues uh, around reproducibility, such as uh, unconscious bias, perverse incentives, experimental design, among others, there are, of course, many steps institutions can take to raise awareness and overcome the associated challenges, such as bolstering research integrity training or mentoring and data management programs. To that end, uh, we recognize that we could leverage technology tools to help meet the challenges of potentially inconsistent standards and practices around data, which brings me to a point of focus, providing an ERN solution for our campus and maximizing use of the platform is an important step in the direction to support our researchers in maintaining the highest levels of credibility in their work. Before we talk about our implementation at Penn, let's talk a little bit about lab notebooks in general. Now, lab notebook is where a researcher enters observations, protocols, and notes as they conduct their work. Traditionally, in bench science, a lab notebook uh, might look something like this. Um, the place where you record experiments and analyses. And since it's a place for um, a record of all their work, some people even paste printouts of electronic data in their notebooks. This is totally acceptable in the scientific community. I could imagine that some of you technology-oriented folks seeing a printout of data like this may appear like a step backward. At any rate, notebooks are critical to research, though in their traditional form, they do have their drawbacks, potentially including legibility of handwriting, lack of context, missing details and protocols, or haphazard organization. Now, there are, of course, best practices for managing these challenges without the help of an electronic system. However, more and more electronic research notebooks offer solutions to not only address these challenges, but also provide additional benefits that you don't get with pen and paper. In the year end, you could enter observations, protocols, notes, and other data through a computer or a mobile device. If you're not familiar with ERNs, I like to characterize them um, as uh, similar to common online notebook solutions you may be uh, more familiar with like uh, Evernote or OneNote uh, from Microsoft, um, but with features specifically designed to support researchers. ERNs have been widely used in the private sector for many years, but only in the past few years have larger numbers of higher ed institutions started to offer the service to their researchers. While in their most basic form, ERNs replicate and interface much like the pages of a lab notebook. They are considered by many an improvement over paper lab notebooks. I wanna highlight some of the general improvements of the leading ERNs in the market as they were central to our decision to move forward with a solution to help our researchers. Specifically for researchers, uh, improvements include quality of record keeping, the ERNs help document all your work and timestamp everything, um, the ability to search notebook data, uh, you can tag data and find it years later, uh, access or link to data that's already in electronic form, uh, ability to collaborate and share information, including group or project management. It's a great tool for running a lab. Um, and uh, compliance with record keeping, including uh, IP protection. Some features uh, include ability to upload photos of research results or activity or access from multiple locations, secure backups data, and saving time over the paper notebook process. Not everyone at uh, our institution agrees on these improvements. More on that in a bit. But I also want to mention that besides the benefits for researchers, there are also benefits for institutions such as how the leading ERNs uh, help in efforts to address the challenges of reproducibility of research uh, results, which while it's of interest to us as an institution is of course also interest uh, and a benefit to researchers and their stakeholders. ERNs can also help uh, aid in compliance uh, with regulatory or data stewardship requirements and they can support against, uh, they can support guarding against uh, scientific uh, misconduct. And they can also support course instruction in students 
though that is uh, really for another talk and I won't be getting into the classroom side of things today. So there are plenty of advantages to consider. Um, and today, of course, it seems that everything's online. So it's no surprise that um, there's an increasing use of online tools and research, right? And this trend includes lab notebooks. So at Penn, uh, as an institution and as a central administrative office of the Vice Provost for Research, we recognize the value. And we heard interests from a few people here and there. But what did our broader research community think? And how did we navigate a large decentralized institution? Early on in our process, we explored ideas and engaged with our research community stakeholder groups and committees. We solicited input from researchers and campus leadership to determine need and ensure whether we, whether we did um, that, we're at, whatever we did, we maximized the solution's value. We worked with uh, campus partners in our libraries and uh, IT organizations, and we presented our ideas and findings to various standing uh, committees across campus. And when I look back, I count that we got out in front of at least six different uh, campus-wide committees throughout the process. So overall, we did a lot of communicating across the university. And an important piece of this effort included multiple surveys. First, we did a small poll of around a dozen faculty for anecdotal feedback. And generally, there was a lot of interest but also some great feedback that brought to surface a few risks and challenges. Then we conducted a broad survey of our research community, community with um, uh, 751 responses, uh, including uh, 250 from faculty, which I should say that response rate alone was no small feat. In any case, these results contributed significantly to our system requirements. And notably, nearly 90% answered yes or maybe to the question of whether they would use an electronic research notebook system if the university provided it. And we found that 74% of folks were not currently using ERNs in their work. And of the 26% that were, they were leveraging a wide spectrum of tools. That's okay, since we don't expect a single tool to be perfect for every person or project. Some of the responses to our survey indicated concerns or reasons why some researchers would not use ERNs, such as research stops if no connectivity, or try opening a Word document from the 1990s, or simply, I don't trust such systems. These perspectives are valid, and ERN solutions may not be the panacea for everyone. Nevertheless, when we examine these, these numbers, what did we see? The main takeaway was that the opportunity was real. As we did our fact finding and gathered requirements, we had already begun evaluating the market. We reviewed the literature in journals uh, and so forth to better understand the value and effectiveness of ERN solutions. We examined the leading products. We uh, interviewed colleagues from uh, peer institutions, maybe some of whom are watching. And as I am sure many of you have evaluated software solutions. Besides aligning with our functional requirements and features wish list, there were other key elements we reviewed, such as information security, uh, system availability, uh, incident response, uh, capabilities to integrate with our campus SSO, uh, and so on. With any of the solutions, there were important considerations. For one, we recognize that for researchers, migrating to a cloud service introduces new risks that they might want to consider and plan for before adoption. Additionally, no matter our direction, we had to accept that ERNs may not be necessary, appropriate, or desirable to all researchers at Penn. So our goal was to select a product that met the general needs of the Penn research community. And ultimately, Lab Archives was selected as the best solution um, for Penn. So what do we do to implement? As I described, we had engaged with many folks on campus, but now it was time to dive into the details. And in moving forward with our selected solution, we did our due diligence with the contracting pieces, collaborated with our campus information security and privacy advisors, and assured alignment with our data protection standards. As we turn to implementation, we organized a stakeholder advisory group comprised of leaders representing key Penn schools and divisions. 
Input from this group was critical to the project's success. They helped us with overall direction as well as the nuts and bolts of the system-wide configuration decisions. In this group, uh, this group helped liaise with key stakeholders across Penn. We did the real work and configured and tested our instance and worked with our central IT group to set up a single sign-on with Penn login credentials. And we pulled together a pilot of around 75 users and conducted a pilot survey to gather uh, further feedback and confirm that we were on track. Overall, it went pretty smoothly, though we encountered some small issues. For example, we uh, paid very close attention to the user experience of the initial account setup and found that some people in our pilot were getting a welcome email that said uh, at the top, dear, uh, and then their last name in all caps with two commas. Um, it wasn't exactly the first impression we were aiming for. Now, it turned out that there was a parsing issue at play and how we constructed some of our um, people directory listings. Um, uh, I mean, can you, as a uh, higher ed IT professional, believe that not all universities fed person data to the vendor in precisely the exact same format? Yeah, neither could I. So anyway, we worked with the vendor to resolve this minor issue, and I think shoring up these kinds of details helped us with a successful launch. Now, as we got closer to launch, we collaborated with a number of campus partners to communicate and market the availability of the system. Announcements were distributed by our different schools' respective deans of research offices to bolster localized promotion, and we also promoted the system in various campus newsletters, uh, and we created a dedicated website, which was instrumental in communicating sign-up, uh, support, and documentation. Also, we built a strong relationship with the vendor, Lab Archives. We worked through the challenges of ramping up, and we championed the solution, and today we continue to provide them ongoing feedback, and we have a seat on its advisory board for its internet to NetPlus service. As users came online, a key point of focus was facilitating training for our users. As with other new systems, not everyone adopted lab archives in the same manner. Some people want to dive right in and figure things out on their own, and others need a trainer to walk them through how to use it. The vendor offered to provide training, so we took them up on it, and the project team played more of a coordinating role. We set out to help people get started by offering general training sessions available to everyone. So we would coordinate with the trainer from Lab Archives, send out invitations, and lo and behold, no investigators would show up. After this happened a couple times, we switched strategies. Instead of inviting folks to come show up at a general introductory session, we started reaching out to individual labs and setting up times where we could uh, we would bring the training to them in their space according to their schedule. This proved to be a more effective approach in helping teams get set up with the system. And in the first few months, we facilitated around 15 training sessions, most of which were held directly in lab group spaces. Lab Archives was very supportive in providing this extra training. As adoption grew, we shifted from offering training, we shifted to offering training on an ongoing basis. Uh, we generally kept it to a manageable number of training sessions, often tailored to specific labs, but sometimes we combine, we'll combine uh, a couple labs into one session. As a service providers at Penn, we continue to make the personal connections between our labs and the vendor, and the vendor continues to conduct the training. And in a sense, we're just playing a role of go-between, but our constituents seem to appreciate this coordination to help get them off the ground. And now we've advanced to the point where we can offer open training sessions and people will actually come. Back last fall, the team orchestrated a two-day electronic research notebook days event. Primarily training sessions, the program uh, also included a talk from our vice provost for research discussing the significance of research notebooks. And additionally, a couple of Penn researchers shared their experiences uh, with Lab Archives, setting the stage with real examples. About 100 researchers participated, including faculty, postdocs, grad students, and research staff spanning diverse fields. Additionally, as we began the last two academic years, one of our major graduate programs incorporated ERNs into their new student orientation week. Pre-pandemic, the vendor came to campus and worked with upwards of 100 new students to get them set up and acquainted with the system. This year, we held a Zoom session for the students. I believe that such efforts are contributing to training the next generation of scientists best practices for managing and organizing research data. 
As I mentioned before, Penn is organizationally complex and decentralized. With that in mind, we went with a framework to offer a new centralized solution, but not demand a significant support burden, either centrally or from our distributed uh, school IT groups. In terms of ongoing support, I often see a model in higher ed systems where we IT folk roll out a system and feel the need to be or be near the front lines to all issues that arise. However, for this system, we went with the goal, the old go to the bookstore and buy a box model. Remember those days you would get software from a box off the shelf with disks inside? Oh, wait, uh, I guess some of you may be asking, what, what are disks? But anyway, in those circumstances, if you had a problem, you would call the vendor directly or read the manual or find um, help in creative ways. So in a sense, we're channeling that here and we rely on our constituents to contact the vendor directly for assistance. And it seems that most of our users are comfortable going directly to the vendor and accessing the um, vendor provided documentation that we link to from our website. But for our colleagues who still need something closer to home, that's fine. And we still offer a place to go for support in partnership with our libraries, as well as an opt-in community email listserv and the um, aforementioned um, dedicated website, which as of this week has uh, averages around 850 page views in a month. So again, with this approach to support, we have facilitated schools across Penn to offer the solution to the researchers without adding yet another support burden for their IT operations. So what has the impact been? In terms of usage, after two years, Year-end accounts have been created by over 2,500 users in over 125 departments across 11 Penn schools. These users are faculty, research staff, lab directors, undergrads, grad students, and postdocs, spanning the entire research community uh, across a wide range of fields, including chemistry, biology, mechanical engineering, psychology, ophthalmology, genetics, periodontics, and vet medicine. Now, earlier, you may remember that I mentioned some of the benefits of an ERN system, and here's that slide again. You may ask, do we have data that demonstrates that we have made research more reproducible, or that ERNs have reduced workload, increased collaboration, or made procedures more consistent? Great question. Unfortunately, we cannot yet make quantifiable direct connections between using the tool and these outcomes. However, we have anecdotes. We hear examples across a range of labs and disciplines with positive results in many of these areas. We have a neuroscientist who swe whose lab swears by the system to store and retrieve large data files in consistent and organized methods and foster collaboration across the research team. An ophthalmology lab that creates uh, templates for different experiments, saving themselves time. Lab staff print out assays for a given day, conduct them, gather data, and then import directly into lab archives, automatically filing in the proper location. We've heard from another researcher who creates custom forms in their notebook to collect data in consistent formats and reports that it improves efficiency and accuracy. And what about in the age of COVID-19? A professor in cell and developmental biology who uses lab archives told me about a colleague who was adamantly opposed to ERNs, who, when asked recently for results, said they can't remember the outcome. And since they weren't able to go into the lab due to the, due to the pandemic, uh, they, uh, they said that they were waiting for a photo of a lab notebook page from another colleague who was going on site. So it seems like ERNs would be all the more valuable these days. That being said, for the first couple of months of the pandemic, there was a dip in usage that we saw as research slowed down, but we have since seen it return to similar usage levels as uh, before the pandemic, and it will surely be interesting to see how things play out over the coming months. These anecdotes are real examples that demonstrate a degree of impact, and we hope that the system continues to be valuable to our researchers. So looking back at our discussion, my hope is that through this discussion, you can see how we looked at a couple of common challenges. One, around reproducibility uh, and manual research processes in general, challenges both your researchers and institutions may face, and see how we turn to an ERN system as a solution. And two, 
as we at Penn face the challenge of how to implement this system at a large complex, complex institution, some complexities that you may also enjoy, and consider how you may learn from our framework that included a, a lot of campus engagement, a lot of communicating and marketing, uh, developing and adapting a training approach, and now offering continued training as well as events to highlight the offering. I hope that you can take what we discussed here and consider how it relates to research at your institution and perhaps the projects uh, on your plate. And I also hope that you may have a greater appreciation for the motivations for and impacts of electronic research notebook solutions in general. That concludes my presentation. Uh, feel free to reach out to me with uh, questions. Uh, or ideas, I would love to hear from you. My email is on your screen. Uh, thank you all for your time. Just one more sentiment in closing. I just want to honor the memory of Greg Palmer, a colleague who contributed greatly to this project and who is missed dearly by many. <laughs>